Hi and welcome back to Scotty's Tech.info. I'm Scotty with my co-host Cletus. And uh, back in July of 2018, I made a video called 5G is just the tip of the iceberg. And in that video, I talked about some studies that have been, that have been done about uh, the negative health effects of upcoming 5G systems, 5G wireless, uh, including the fact that uh, the sweat glands in your skin act as helical antennae for 5G millimeter wave frequencies. And I also talked about some other studies uh, involving Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, 2G, 3G, 4G, and how all these microwave frequency um, radio waves are basically negatively impacting our health. They're having an effect on people, uh, plants, insects, all kinds of stuff. To be perfectly blunt, I never really expected that video to be as popular as it was for the simple reason that there are a lot of things going on in the world. Political divisions, social divisions, even divisions between men and women for crying out loud. So it kind of seemed to me like uh, not enough people would really care about the evils of 5G and probably they would just continue to roll it out and that would be that. But I felt like, well, I should at least say something about it because it is something that concerns me. It's concerned me for a long time. As regular viewers know, uh, I am not a fan of various wireless technologies because there are all these studies showing that it's probably not very good for us. Uh, and it's kind of like asbestos, you know. Everybody was like, at first, oh, no, it's okay. Then all of a sudden, it's like, oh, my God, it causes cancer. Get rid of all of it. But, of course, you get rid of, of all of the asbestos after it's everywhere, you know, which is not really a very productive way of doing things. So, to my surprise, uh, so far this year, there have actually been quite a few developments that have uh, given me some hope. So... I want to talk about a few a few of the recent developments and also uh, a particular petition that I found. So to start off here, there is an article on brusselstimes.com entitled Radiation Concerns Halt Brussels 5G Development for Now. And this was released on April 1st of 2019. And uh, the article says, Plans for a pilot project to provide high-speed 5G wireless internet in Brussels have been halted due to fears for the health of citizens, according to reports. In July, the government concluded an agreement with three telecom operators to relax the strict radiation standards in Brussels. But according to the region, it is now impossible to estimate the radiation from the antennas required for the service. And uh, Environment Minister Céline Frémont says, quote, I cannot welcome such technology if the radiation standards, which must protect the citizens, are not respected, 5G or not. The people of Brussels are not guinea pigs whose health I can sell at a profit. We cannot leave anything to doubt. You rock. Um, it's worth keeping in mind here that different countries have different wireless standards, and by that I mean um, for the protection of people's health. Uh, power levels in the U.S., for example, are allowed to be six times higher than they are in Belgium. So Belgium's rules are already actually far more strict than in most other places. Um, so I guess it's not terribly surprising that they have uh, sort of put a moratorium on 5G deployment for the time being. But that I read that article, and I, I actually kind of fell off my chair because I never expected that sort of thing to happen. And uh, it's very difficult for that sort of thing to happen for, for essentially a city or a region to decide, no, I don't want 5G, especially in the United States, as we'll see shortly. So that was the first article that, that gave me a little bit of hope. Now, then, someone actually sent to me a particular uh, petition, an online petition, which you can find at 5gspaceappeal.org. And it's just called International Appeal, Stop 5G on Earth and in Space. So, uh, this petition was initially released in September 2018, which was uh, a few months after I released my 5G is the Tip of the Iceberg video, uh, two months after, in fact, and so far, the petition, uh, as of the end of April, it has 83,000, more than 83,000 people have signed it. Uh, we need to get that number a little bit higher. Uh, as for the actual petition, you can go to 5gspaceappeal.org and read it. It's very long. It has, like, a boatload of hyperlinks in it. Uh, it has 123 references. It's kind of long and complicated, and, of course, I don't sign anything without reading the whole thing. So, of course, I spent, like, a long time reading the whole thing, and clicking every single hyperlink and, you know, reading all the stuff on, say, the FCC's websites and the rules. And, uh, you know, I wanted to get an idea of, you know, 
is this something I really want to sign? Is this something I really want to back up? And I concluded that, yes, it is, because it's pretty darn well done. So I'm going to kind of give a, a quick summary of some of the important points. If you want to read the whole thing, obviously, uh, I'll put links to everything I'm talking about down in the description below the video. Um, <clears throat> so... They start the appeal with, to the UN, WHO, EU, Council of Europe, and governments of all nations. We, the undersigned scientists, doctors, environmental organizations, and citizens from various countries, urgently call for a halt to the deployment of the 5G wireless network, including 5G from space satellites. 5G will massively increase exposure to radio frequency radiation on top of the 2G, 3G, and 4G networks for telecom already in place. RF radiation has been proven harmful for humans and the environment. The deployment of 5G constitutes an experiment on humanity and the environment that is defined as a crime under international law. And then they kind of go into uh, some, it's an executive summary, blah, 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 blah. Uh, it starts to get interesting because they write that the planned density of radio frequency transmitters is impossible to envisage. In addition to millions of new 5G base stations on Earth and 20,000 new satellites in space, 200 billion transmitting objects, according to estimates, will be part of the Internet of Things by 2020, and eventually they expect, a few years later, to have over 1 trillion transmitting Internet of Things 5G gizmos uh, around the world. So, here we have the, the whole thing with 5G. Uh, you're probably aware. I'll just kind of recap real quick. You have 5G. They're going to start off with uh, lower frequencies, frequencies closer to what 4G uses. And then, of course, you're going to have these phased array antennas, which means you're going to have it's essentially an array of antennas which allows you to have steerable beams. And this is because eventually they're going to have up to like 60 gigahertz or possibly higher uh, millimeter wave radio waves and so you, they need these phased array antennas so they can like shoot signals and, and, and uh, direct signals uh, in, in specific directions, possibly bounce them off objects so that you can maintain reception and of course your 5G smartphone or other gizmo will also have one of these phased array antennas uh, and so it's kind of a different system. But in order to make it work, because eventually they're going to be using these higher frequencies, they need uh, upwards of 200 times more antennas or base stations than they have right now for the existing 4G system. Now, that's a little bit crazy because when you think about it, uh, that means they're going to be doing stuff, as we all know, like putting 5G, you know, mini base stations, mini antenna systems on, like, you know, every light pole going down a street or something through a neighborhood. Uh, and this is to get proper coverage because the, the higher frequency 5G signals are blocked by things like a simple door or leaves on a tree or whatever. Um, so this begs the question, well, who the heck is going to pay for all this? Because obviously there's a massive infrastructure right now uh, with existing 3G and 4G systems, and suddenly they're going to replace all those antennas or, or even add 5G to the existing 4G, and then they're also going to increase the total number of antennas by 200. That's going to cost a lot of money and take a lot of time to deploy. Uh, I know it's already deployed in certain cities around the world, but yeah, the, the costs involved there are kind of insane. And of course, you and I are going to end up paying for that. Well, why are we going to end up paying for that? We're going to end up paying for that because there are industry people who think that the future is the Internet of Things. And in summary, that's just the idea that uh, everything you own will soon be connected to the Internet. So we're going to have smart toasters that are connected to the Internet and, you know, Internet-connected refrigerators and internet-connected undies, and internet-connected smart dust, everything will be connected to the internet. And in order to achieve this, of course, you need uh, 5G operating at higher frequencies. Uh, you get more bandwidth for more devices. You can support more devices. You get a faster speed, and you get lower latency, so less wait time for signals to go bounce back and forth, basically. The question then is, like, who actually wants this internet of things? I've talked to many people, and some people don't even know what the Internet of Things is, and at which point, of course, I explain. But in every case, whether they know or not, even if I have to say, okay, here's what it is, every single person I've talked to says, yeah, why do we need that? I, I don't want that. So it kind of seems like the only reason we're getting 5G 
and the, this whole internet of things is because there are people in the industry who want to make more money. Uh, of course, if you have massive arrays of, you know, 60 gigahertz millimeter wave antennae everywhere, well, then you can do all kinds of other fun things. I'll let you use your imagination for that one. You also have the ability to hoover up even more massive quantities of data, which you can use for all sorts of purposes, including selling people even more stuff. Um, so, of course, the big question is who the heck is going to pay for all of this? And the answer is you and me, and we don't even want it. So, okay, that's kind of where it's coming from. The other thing to note is that 5G is not going to be everywhere. Uh, for example, in a rural area, the plan is if you're in a city, you know, dense, densely populated areas, you're going to have your major towers. They're going to have smaller, smaller uh, 5G cells, so to speak, on light poles and that sort of thing. But the further and further away you get from civilization, i.e. a large city, um, then you might not have the actual full 5G system. They're going to be using things like 5GE, which is actually just a flavor of 4G, uh, because in rural areas it's far less practical. Uh, and of course, because it's expensive, if you have you know a sparsely populated area, yeah, you're, what are you going to put an antenna up for each individual house or something? It's not really practical. And that is actually um, partially where 5G satellite systems come into play, which we'll get into a little bit later. But um, those are actually slightly different than 5G towers in any case. So, so that's kind of good news is that uh, if you live in a rural area, you're not necessarily going to get 5G anytime soon. Uh, you may actually get uh, 4G, an upgraded 4G system, because there is 4G. They call it like different names. One of them is like LTE Advanced, and uh, these newer 4G systems actually give you up to one gigabit per second of bandwidth, which is actually pretty high. Most people don't even have a gigabit per second for their wired internet connection at home. So... Um, <clears throat> Okay, so they carry on and they write, Despite widespread denial, the evidence that radio frequency radiation is harmful to life is already overwhelming. Well over 10,000 peer-reviewed studies have been published. Actually, that is not quite correct, because there is a, uh, it's some kind of university teaching hospital in Aachen, Germany, and they have a website called emf-portal.org, emfportal.org. And this website, its primary purpose, I guess, is to uh, have a catalog of all the various studies that have been published over the years on the negative effects on health uh, due to different types of radio waves. And their database contains 28,205 papers. So, yeah, there's a lot of information out there when somebody says, eh, it's non-ionizing, there's no risk. Yeah, there are minimum 10,000 actually more like 28,000 published papers saying that this stuff is probably not good for us. Uh, anyway, they carry on. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Levels of RF radiation that are tens to hundreds of times greater than what exists today. That's what we're going to be getting with, with 5G. Okay, then they move on and they talk a little bit about uh, 5G phones and 5G base stations. And they, they write that each 5G phone will contain dozens of tiny antennas, as I explained. Uh, the effective power of those beams, according to the FCC, can be as much as 20 watts, which is 10 times more powerful than the levels permitted for current phones. Now, I went on the FCC website and compared the, the, the 5G standard, because they have, they have things separated into different frequency bands, and it's kind of a pain to actually figure out. And then they, they give you numbers in, like, you know, minus 43 dBm, so you have to do some calculations and get a power comparison. Uh, so, of course, I did all that, and sure enough, for 5G, higher power levels are actually permitted. The thing with 5G phones, especially, like a 5G portable gizmo, is that they're not going to be transmitting at 20 watts. That's utterly insane, because the lithium-ion or lithium-polymer battery technology that's used in modern smartphones, like, is not going to support a 20-watt transmit power. You're going to get, like, no battery life. So, uh, in terms of 5G phones... Yeah, it's going to be transmitting at the higher frequency, but that those super high power levels, that's probably not really a concern as far as I know. 5G base stations, on the other hand, uh, that's another story. Because they write, each 5G base station will contain hundreds or thousands of antennas aiming multiple laser-like beams simultaneously at all cell phones and user devices in the service area. 
Uh, this technology is called Multiple Input, Multiple Output, or MIMO. FCC rules permit the effective radiated power of a 5G base station's beams to be as much as 30,000 watts per 100 megahertz of spectrum. Uh, this is tens to hundreds of times more powerful than the levels permitted for current base stations. I did the calculations, and indeed for 5G base stations, according to my math, uh, 5G base stations will allow to be 19 times more powerful than existing 3G and 4G base stations. Um, that's a little bit crazy, because that's crazy. That's a lot of power. So that's, that's not very good. Then they move on to space-based 5G, and they say, okay, 5G from space will be from a combined 20,000 satellites in low and medium Earth orbit, and then they talk about the combined power output of these 20,000 satellites will eventually be 5 million watts, which of course sounds very scary. Uh, but they do note that uh, the energy reaching the ground from satellites will be less than that from ground-based antennas. Uh, however, it will irradiate areas of the Earth not reached by other transmitters. And that's actually true, as I mentioned earlier. The frequencies that these satellites are supposed to use are slightly lower than what the ground-based 5G will use. Um, it's not exactly the same type of you know modulation scheme and all that kind of stuff. And of course, even though it's 5 million watts, um, there are actually, I added it up, and there are, I, I counted 26,000 satellites eventually that these various companies want to launch into space. And it's not much different from existing internet by satellite services. Um, it is actually faster. There are some other interesting things, like uh, I think it was uh, SpaceX wants to launch uh, 5G satellite internet. And they have some patented thing where their constellation of satellites will actually shoot laser beams between each satellite as sort of like optical data links, uh, which is kind of a newfangled and, and sort of crazy idea. One of the ways that their system will supposedly be better. Uh, but again, the point here is that even though the total power level of all these satellites orbiting Earth is uh, crazy, it's crazy high, uh, the way that satellite internet works You've got a satellite way up here, it's transmitting, and the, the, the power level of the signals received on the surface of the Earth, like you in your house, is going to be way lower than what's hitting you from, say, like a 5G tower. Uh, and also it will be a lower frequency and probably different types of modulation and everything. So uh, it's not the same animal. It's still probably not terribly good, as we'll see a little bit later, because even low power levels are not good for you. So that's the scoop. They give some explanations on that. And then they go into the actual harmful effects of radio frequency radiation that have already been proven. And I'm not going to go uh, too much into this, uh, except to say that they note that in 2015, 215 scientists from 41 countries communicated their alarm to the United Nations and the World Health Organization. And they talked about these various impacts on health. It's worth noting that these 215 scientists from 41 countries included, uh, you know, PhDs and MDs from the likes of Harvard and Berkeley and schools of medicine like all over the world. So we're not talking about, you know, uh, these people are no slouches. And uh, the list of effects of various types of EMF and radio frequency waves on health include alteration of heart rhythm, altered gene expression, altered metabolism, altered stem cell development, cancers, cardiovascular disease, cognitive impairment, DNA damage, impacts on general well-being, increased free radicals, learning and memory deficits, impaired sperm function and quality, miscarriage, neurological damage, obesity and diabetes, oxidative stress, and in children, it includes autism and ADHD. Hmm. Also, they note that the damage goes well beyond the human race because uh, various frequencies also affect ants, birds, trees, plants, frogs, fruit flies, honeybees, various other insects, various other mammals, Mice, rats, blah, 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 down to uh, microbiological effects, which means f certain frequencies have an effect on bacteria, which is obviously not good. Now, this part is particularly interesting, and this brings us to uh, interesting development number two. They write that the WHO's International Agency for Research on Cancer, Cancer or IARC, concluded in 2011 that radio frequencies between 30 kilohertz and 300 gigahertz are possibly carcinogenic to humans. Now, actually, the IARC said in 2002 that ELF, or extremely low frequency uh, waves from things like you know power lines and, and that sort of thing, 
in 2002, they said those low-frequency sources are possibly carcinogenic. That was in 2002. In 2011, they said the high-frequency stuff is possibly carcinogenic. But it just so happens in the journal The Lancet, there is an advisory group making recommendations on priorities for the IARC, and 29 scientists from 18 countries in March of 2019, in March of this year, the, the, the advisory group recommended to the IARC that they reevaluate with high priority the effects of non-ionizing radiofrequency radiation. And the reason they think this should be reevaluated with a high priority is because of new bioassay and mechanistic evidence to warrant reevaluation of the classification. In other words, in 2002, they said low-frequency stuff was possibly bad for our health. In 2011, they said high-frequency stuff is possibly bad for our health. And now, in 2019, it is recommended that they look at this again because there's so much more evidence that's come forward that this advisory committee of really smart people says, yeah, maybe you guys want to look at that again because things are not looking good. So in addition to Brussels uh, stopping 5G for the time being, we also have uh, the WHO slash IARC being encouraged to reevaluate the negative effects of all this EMF. So that's good. Uh, they go on, there's a section on how the deployment of 5G satellites must be prohibited, then another section on how 5G is very different from 4G, and they write that peer-reviewed studies have uh, been published, and they indicate that there is resonant absorption by insects, because apparently insects absorb 100 times as much radiation at millimeter wave frequencies as they do at 4G frequencies. So uh, these millimeter waves that 5G will use are going to be extremely bad for insects, according to peer-reviewed studies that have happened more recently. And that's obviously very bad because things like bees, yeah, like they pollinate things and we don't all want to starve because that would suck. So moving along, this section is also extremely interesting and we come to the next uh, exciting moment, the next uh, fun development in the battle. There's a section entitled, Regulators Have Deliberately Excluded the Scientific Evidence of Harm. And they talk about how stakeholders thus far in the development of 5G have been industry and governments, while renowned international EMS scientists who've actually documented and studied all these biological effects on humans, animals, insects, plants, and so on, they're actually sounding the alarm bell, but the regulatory bodies and government and the industry pundits are, they're just sort of like conspiring together to push it on through and they're ignoring all the evidence. Um, this was actually particularly interesting because uh, earlier this year, in somewhere around February of 2019, there was actually a Senate hearing in the US. And um, I'll link to that video down below. It's utterly fascinating because uh, Senator Blumenthal was actually asking some industry representatives about 5G, and he specifically said, is 5G, you know, harmful to health? And of course they said no, because power levels, blah, blah, blah. Uh, he actually asked them directly, these industry representatives, he said, have you guys actually done any studies? Have you actually put any money, have you funded at all any studies on the health effects, one way or the other, of 5G? And they said, no, we have done no studies. We have spent zero dollars on studying whether or not 5G is actually safe for people, animals, or anything else. Then he also comments that he inquired of the FCC because, of course, the industry pundit said, hey, well, we're just going along with the FCC guidelines, and the FCC guidelines say we're okay. Except the FCC guidelines are allowing power levels that are 19 times higher and with 4G systems, which is totally crazy, because the U.S. limits for 4G are already six times higher than what's allowed in Belgium, as I mentioned earlier. So the FCC is not really actually regulating. Uh, they're just sort of allowing the industry to do what they want. The industry says, hey, FCC, we're, we're following your lead, and the FCC is like, we don't know. So then Blumenthal actually asked the FCC directly and said, hey, can you actually send me any scientific studies, peer-reviewed, blah, 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 that you have showing that 5G is actually safe. And the FCC apparently did not respond because they didn't do any. They don't have any. So <laughs> it's a, 
that's um, that's pretty nutty, and it's especially nutty because uh, in the U.S. there's actually another link in in the uh, text of this petition that says that. Uh, National governments, especially in the U.S., are taking steps to ensure a barrier-free regulatory environment. They are prohibiting local authorities from enforcing governmental laws. And that's a hyperlink, and I clicked it, and it takes me to the FCC website. And indeed, if you read it, the FCC uh, basically has rules that say that, yes, local or you know, city or state governments, they can actually... Uh, you know, we can have kind of like a hearing and you can present your evidence that it's bad for health. But at the end of the day, you don't really have the right to stop it unless you can prove that it's bad for people's health. Except it's kind of worded in such a way that it's basically like, well, but in any case, if we, the federal government, say that it's perfectly safe, then it doesn't really matter what you present to us. You, you're overruled. So... Um, yeah, city and state governments in in the U.S. apparently have actually no right, regardless of whatever evidence they produce or fancy scientists they bring in or whatever. It's like the FCC says, nope, we overrule you. We're in control here. But then when they're asked, well, hey, FCC, have you actually, you know, you, the FDA, anybody, has anybody actually done any safety studies on this? The answer is no. And yet there are 28,000 studies showing that this stuff is actually bad for us, which is kind of crazy. Whatever, man. So finally they get on and they say, new safety standards are needed and should be based on cumulative exposure and not only on power levels, but also on frequency, bandwidth, modulation, waveform, pulse width, and other properties that are biologically important. You think? And finally, on the end, they call upon the UN the World Health Organization, the EU, Council of Europe, and governments of all nations uh, to do various things, including to appoint immediately, without industry influence, international groups of independent, truly impartial EMF and health scientists with no conflicts of interest for the purpose of establishing new international safety standards for RF radiation that are not based only on power levels, that consider cumulative exposure and that protect against all health and environmental effects, not just thermal effects, and not just effects on humans. Amen. And of course, at the end, you can read, you know, the, the initial signatories to this thing, um, yeah, you've got like a PhD in anthropology and psychiatry, you've got a PhD in professor in electrical engineering, you've got a, a, a biologist who has a master's in environmental education, you've got a doctor and professor and also member of European Parliament, another biologist, um, you have uh, one lady here who's an MD, PhD, SM, HDR, I don't even know what the, all those letters mean, and also the former chief of research unit of a, Epidemiology for Cancer Prevention at the International Agency for Research on Cancer. And finally, we have our, our good old buddy, Dr. Martin Paul, Professor Emeritus of Biochemistry and Basic Medical Services, who is one of my personal heroes because he's kind of leading the charge against all this, you know, 5G and all this other nonsense. So I encourage you to go to 5gspaceappeal.org and read the petition if you'd like. Uh, definitely sign it. Uh, if you know of other, part of other petitions, Post them in the comments below. Um, yeah, we we definitely need to sort of keep the pressure on. Um, you've got Belgium saying no, uh, or Brussels rather saying no. We're not going to have five G. You've got you know the IARC international bodies going. Hang on a minute. We need to look at this stuff again. Um, you have you know Senate hearings where they're basically making the industry executives look like total morons. Uh, they're you know blatantly pointing out that like no safety studies have been done. And yet, you know, when you and I go out there and say, hey, you know, we don't really want 5G, you know, you're told that you're, you know, you're wearing like a tinfoil hat. And it's like, hang on a minute, there are 28,000 studies showing that this stuff isn't safe. Now, keep in mind that um, those 28,000 studies are not only about 5G, because, you know, many of them date back to like even the, the 70s, uh, as all these different radio frequency technologies were released and frequencies got higher and higher, studies were always done and they were essentially always ignored. Uh, especially by, you know, government regulatory agencies and uh, by the industry themselves, of course, because they wanted to simply sell more stuff. Um, 
And the thing is, okay, so there are 28,000 studies. Let's just assume for a minute that 27,000 of those studies were done by total lunatics. 27,000 of those studies are done by crazy people. Okay, that still leaves 1,000 studies left that were not done by crazy people. And that point out things like, you know, the, the helical sweat glands and the effects on insects and, you know, brain cancer. And, uh, you know, there was a study that was done about uh, uh, brain cancer in rats from mobile phone use. And that's why the higher frequencies were, were set in 2011 as a, 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 po a possible carcinogen, except oh, for glioma, tumors in the brain and spine. That was in t the, the IARC in 2011 said, yes. Cell phones are a brain cancer risk. Oh, well, but more study is required. We're not really sure. It's possibly carcinogenic. And now in March of 2019, they're saying, uh, actually, yeah, we need to look at that again because more evidence has come forward and it ain't good. Uh, so even if only 1,000 of these 28,000 studies are showing that this stuff is bad for us, when you ask somebody like the FCC or the industry people, uh, all they can say is, uh, oh, I don't know, ask that guy. And then that guy says, we don't have any studies showing it's safe. And then they, they start talking about power levels again. One quick thing about power levels is uh, the there have been several studies done showing that biological effects occur even at near zero power levels. Uh, they, they write that studies have shown that effects have been found at 0 0.02 picowatts per square centimeter or less. When you have radio frequency waves at 0 0.02 picowatts per square centimeter or less, this causes altered genetic structure in E. coli bacteria and in rats, altered EEGs in humans, uh, growth stimulation in bean plants, and the stimulation of ovulation in chickens. Now, to put that in plain English, uh, most worldwide standards for power levels, you know, what is a safe power level, are measured in microwatts or millionths of a watt. Now, what they're saying is that at 0 0.02 trillionths of a watt, negative effects have been found. So the industry is saying, yeah, but we're under FCC power levels. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, we're fine. Except the FCC actually jacked the power levels up for 5G, which that's crazy. And yet the research is actually showing that the existing safe power levels, before they jacked it up by a factor of 19 for 5G, those existing very low safe power levels are already, wait for it, tens of millions to a billion times higher than what is actually safe. That's it in plain English. So, yeah, it's totally nuts. And you know, usually when this kind of thing happens, you know, people say, oh, but you're like anti-technology. Like, look, I'm a techie. Uh, I'm not anti-technology. I love technology. But I don't love t technology at the expense of our health, because that just makes no sense. And yes, further research is needed. So yeah, we need more Senate hearings. We need more people signing petitions. We need more contacting of you know representatives. And and you know now that there's momentum, keep pushing. Uh, because ultimately, what's needed is enough actual independent research to really actually study this stuff. Uh, internationally, no government involvement, no industry involvement especially, just independent, scientific, collective research to look at all this stuff and come up with international, global standards uh, so that we know what is safe and what is not. And that doesn't mean that we have to get rid of everything. It means that we have to, you, you can still have 5G, but the thing is, it's like asbestos. Why would you deploy 5G and then, like, years later go, oh, geez, everybody's dying of cancer. And, like, you know what? We just found it's the 5G. Now that we've deployed 200 times more antennas and made you pay for all this crap, yeah, we're going to tear it down and put up a 6G system, which will actually do some research and prove that it's safe. And, yeah, you can pay for that, too. Why not just say, look, nobody actually needs 5G right now. Nobody actually needs the Internet of Things right now. Let's just, let's just pull back on the reins, hold back for a time, do an international independent study, find out about all this stuff, and then change it. And like I said in my earlier video, if it's the pulse nature of these signals that's dangerous, well, do a study and find out, like, you know, is there a way to, to, to do these things differently? Like, we're all, we've got so many geniuses. It's, it's, you don't have to take everything and, like, flush it down the toilet. 
it's not like a black and white situation. It's not like either you have your wireless stuff or you just go back to the Stone Age. Like, no, it's, it's you do the research and you find out how to do these things more safely. You actually pay attention to the between 10 and 28,000 studies that have been done. And you say, okay, let's take this seriously. Let's look at it and let's develop wireless technologies that actually are safe. And there is a way to do it. I'm convinced of that. We just need to know how. But we can't know how unless we get everybody on the same page and everyone concerned about these things before it's too late. Because as I also mentioned, you know, people say, yeah, yeah, but we had Wi-Fi since like 2001 and like nobody's dying of cancer. Yeah, but as I said before, the children right now, you know, Wi-Fi didn't become widespread to like 2008, 2009. So it's the children right now who are maybe 8, 9, 10 years old. They're the ones who maybe 10 years down the road are going to be hit really hard with, you know, health problems, cancers, you know, God knows what, you know. Why wait until that happens when there's plenty of evidence and plenty of smart people saying, uh, no, we really need to stop and take a look at this. So, um, yeah, I really think we should keep pushing. Um, as I said, like, I never expected this kind of thing to happen, and now all of a sudden it's like, you know, we have a chance to actually change things for the better, and um, it is something that I feel very strongly about. I read the studies. It's it's just like one plus one equals two. Why would you do this and and risk everyone's health? You know, it's worth actually being sure. And based on all the studies that have been done, it's not safe, and we should just make it safe. And I think we can. Um, so, spread the word. Uh, for more techie tips, see scottystech.info. Thanks for watching. See you next time.